Freunde der Deutsche Bank Kunsthalle, dear friends of the Deutsche Bank Kunsthalle, dear friends of Jackson Pollock, dear friends of the University of Iowa Museum of Art, welcome tonight to our yes, concert, moderated concert on hearing Jackson Pollock. Um, ich freue mich wahnsinnig, dass Sie alle heute Abend hier sind. Es ist gleichzeitig auch ein erster Schritt, uns von Jackson Pollock's Moral zu verabschieden. Leider. Insofern feiern wir heute eine kleine Finissage. Wir haben dann zwar noch bis Sonntag einschließlich bis 20 Uhr geöffnet. Ähm, bis dahin kann diese wunderbare Ausstellung und dieses wunderbare Werk von Jackson Pollock noch besichtigt werden, aber heute Abend ist ein ja, Vorabschied, wollen wir es einmal so nennen. Und dafür freuen wir uns sehr, dass wir ein ganz internationales ähm, Team und äh, ja, Musiker-Team, äh, und zwar Musikhistoriker äh, und äh, tatsächlich Musiker zusammen, bekommen haben, dies vor allem auch ein very warm welcome Sean O'Hara. He's the director of the University of Iowa Museum of Art and it's also thanks to the University of, to the University of Iowa. Um, ich sehr Dank, dass wir heute überhaupt vor allem die beiden Professoren aus Iowa hier haben dürfen. Darf ich Ihnen Jennifer Iverson vorstellen und dann an Philips, beide Lehren in Iowa und werden uns heute sozusagen in, ja, in die Welt von Jackson Pollock, vor allem in die Klangwelt, ähm, einführen. Wir haben dazu noch ähm, einen Musiker aus Amerika, auch aus Iowa, Connor, äh, Hanek und ein Trio aus Leipzig. Ähm, werden gleich noch im Detail vorgestellt. Nun aber, ja, freue ich mich auf einen wunderbaren Abend, knappe 60 Minuten hören in unterschiedlicher Art und Weise und ähm, danach werden wir gemeinsam, also haben Sie sowieso noch die Gelegenheit, die Ausstellung weiter zu begutachten ähm, und ähm, wir werden dann im Innenhof gerne noch ein kleines Getränk gemeinsam einnehmen. Nun aber erst einmal Guten Abend. During the early phase of Pollock's career, jazz had fully made the jump from socially unacceptable African American music to the very soundtrack of 1930s American culture. Though a, a palpable divide existed between black and white American cultures during the swing era, the country as a whole had embraced swing style jazz music as the definitive style of popular music. Apart from being the backdrop for American entertainment during these years, jazz had transcended its purely dance music of, uh, jazz had transcend, transcended its role as purely dance music and begun to permeate most facets of American life. Led by the likes of Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, uh, swing music inter oh, my goodness. swing music interweaves itself into the very fabric of American life, serving as a sonic backdrop for radio commercials and carving out a prominent place in motion pictures alongside classical music. While artist Jackson Pollock's work exists in the realm of visual art, Jackson Pollock the man was no stranger to the sounds, rhythms, and spirit of jazz music leading into the Second World War. Despite popular opinion, evidence suggests that Pollock's relationship with jazz was not as overt as many believe. Unlike the work of the Beatniks, Pollock's, work, Pollock's early work does not signify an eager embrace and incorporation of the ethos of jazz music. Though it is commonly believed that Pollock created his most famous works with jazz music spurring them on in the background, it turns out that this is not the case. Scholarly research suggests that Pollock was actually preferred to work in silence, and the direct influence uh, of the music on his work would have taken place primarily in times of leisure 
between work sessions. However, Pollock's love for and frequent interaction with jazz music from the swing era is a well-known fact that is indeed significant. The strength of Pollock's relationship with jazz music is based on the introspective creativity and spontaneity of the style, as the ethos of jazz closely mirrors Pollock's driving uh, desire to create in relation to cues external to the artist. Pollock's wife, the Krasner, supports the strength of Pollock's connection with uh, the spirit of jazz in stating, quote, he thought it was the only other really creative thing happening in this country, end quote. The common practice of multiple performers performing and or recording the same song while placing their own individualized spin on the tune places uh, the focus on creativity uh, in jazz front and center and uh, instantly separates the style from anything else that was happening musically, musically in the Western world. Perhaps this uniquely spontaneous and reactive spirit of what drew, is what drew Pollock so strongly to jazz, as its resemblance to the uh, mindset in creating works such as Mirror is uh, difficult to ignore. Pollock's personal record collection further corroborates the strong relationship with jazz uh, that is packed full of records by those considered to be the, the greats of jazz in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. While no less than 50 individual artists of consequence appear on the list of our 45 RPM records in his collection, artists such as Duke Ellington, Jack Teagarden, Billie Holiday, Jelly Roll Morton, and the incomparable Louis Armstrong appear repeatedly throughout this list. Furthermore, Cole Porter's, Cole Porter's composition Night and Day appears on this list several times over, albeit performed by different artists. While other songs appear more than once, the frequency with which this particular song appears in his collection suggests a relationship that extends well beyond chance. It stands to reason that this particular song bears some heightened significance to Pollock and was, and, and was a tune that was a frequent part of his personal listening habit. I have chosen to perform it night and day in the style of vocalist Billie Holiday, uh, the vocalist whose name appears most frequently, most frequently on Pollock's list of jazz recordings. I will be joined by three musicians, all of Germany. I'll be joined by Jonas Tim on piano. Paul Blonner on bass. That failed on the drums. <laughs> Without further ado, we present to you Cole Porter's Night and Day.
Dixieland and swing jazz permeated the airwaves. But there was something else on the rise at this time, too. I'm speaking about experimental classical music, particularly that composed by John Cage. John Cage, the American experimental composer, was largely unknown when he arrived in New York in 1943. He had grown up on the West Coast and even studied for a short time with Arnold Schoenberg. In the interim, he became very interested in found sounds. By found sounds, I mean that Cage became interested in making music with everyday objects. So he began to put on uh, and to compose percussion pieces for a whole array of everyday objects like anvils, rice bowls, gongs, <laughs> sheet metal, uh, very strange and unusual sounds. When Cage came to New York in 1943, he put on a concert uh, of these found sound percussion works at the Museum of Modern Art. So probably the premier modern art institution, perhaps in the world at that time. Uh, and I'd like to just play you a short excerpt of a piece that Cage played on that concert. It's called First Construction in Metal. Just give me one minute to cue it up here. So this is First Construction in Metal by John Cage premiered at MoMA in 1943. for Jackson Pollock. Mural was painted for Peggy Guggenheim's home for the entryway of her house. Peggy Guggenheim also helped Cage greatly when he came to New York. So she served as a common link and introduced Pollock and Cage both to museum and gallery owners, critics, and fellow artists. So Cage, after the MoMA show, really became ensconced in this abstract expressionist circle in New York. And he met painters including Robert Rauschenberg, Cy Twombly, Jasper Johns, and Jackson Pollock. So Cage and Pollock knew each other. They did not get along. They were not friends. But nevertheless, their art proceeded in very parallel directions. Cage, of course, began with this found sound percussion and then moved to the prepared piano, and then eventually began incorporating chants and aleatory elements into his music. Pollock, on the other hand, moves from the almost figuration to abstract expressionism to his drip canvases, which are perhaps even more famous. So both Pollock and Cage are moving in a parallel way and moving toward their most famous work when they met each other in 1943. So Cage loved these noisy sounds, but at this time, he was mostly accompanying for dancers. Cage began a partnership with Merce Cunningham that would last for his whole life. And um, you can imagine that bringing all kinds of weird percussion objects into a dancer's studio was not practical. It was expensive, it was heavy, there wasn't enough space. So Cage invented a new instrument. He invented the prepared piano, and it's a regular piano with a bunch of interesting objects stuck in between the strings. So at the end, perhaps, you'll have a chance to look. Inside, you'll see screws, bolts, erasers, felt, rubber, all stuck inside the strings in order to create some very wonderful and new timbres from 
a very self-contained and available instrument. So it was a wonderful invention. I'd now like to introduce Connor Hannock, a pianist who's going to talk very briefly about making the preparations inside the piano and then play some movements from John Cage's sonatas and interludes. Hello. So yeah, inside of the piano, and I encourage you to come up after the performance, it looks a bit like a hardware store in here. Um, there are lots of different sizes of bolts and screws, pieces of rubber, um, little snippets of my plastic credit card, actually. Inside. Um, there's a big eraser in the bottom. Um, and all of this is very, very uh, detailed be um, written out in John Cage's score. He has a, a grid and he says, on this string, go out seven and a half inches and put a medium-sized screw in the second and third strings. And so you get out your ruler and you put your screw in, and then sometimes it sounds really good and sometimes it sounds not so good. And so you have to make a little adjustments. Um, and of course the piano that, that Cage was using when he originally made this instrument, um, is different from this piano, and will be different from the next piano that this piece is performed on. Um, so I really love thinking about this piece in the way that Jennifer uh, has set up, that it's this wonderful balance between form and uh, very detailed, rigorous construction. These pieces are very beautifully symmetrical um, and sort of holistically conceived, but at the same time, the sounds that you hear while we had something very specific in mind, will be different at every single performance. So while this piece is very uh, meticulously written out, this will be the first and last time the piece will be heard in this way, which is something that is part of Cage's creative life um, very explicitly later years, but even in this early piece, uh, you know, there's something brewing in his brain. So I'll play four selections, um, the first and fifth sonatas, the second interlude, and then the final sonata, the 16th.
In the opening remarks during a 1950 interview with William Wright, Pollock captured the epitome of both modern art and jazz which emerged in the 1940s. When asked the meaning of modern art, Pollock replied, quote, modern art, to me, is nothing more than the expression of contemporary aims at the age in, uh, at, of the age that we're living in. All cultures have had means and techniques of expressing their immediate aims. The thing that interests me is that today's painters do not have, have to go to a subject matter outside of themselves. They work from a different source. They work from within, end quote. Without intending to, Pollock describes the ethos of bebop style jazz exceedingly well in his statement. Emerging in the, in the early 1940s uh, as the cutting edge of progressive jazz music, bebop was the precise antithesis of its stylistic predecessor, swing in large part due to the, to the commercialization and commodification of swing music, the younger jo uh, generation of jazz musicians during World War II looked upon swing style jazz more so as a means of making a living than music that encouraged and or embraced the, uh, the challenging of boundaries and the free creative spirit for which jazz was known. Uh, what, with dance being the epicenter of swing music's social and cultural relevance uh, to American society, Filling that role was, in fact, somewhat stifling for a younger uh, and musically adventurous jazz musician who was imagining bold new things to say musically, but was afforded little creative space to say it. After all, swing music was built upon the concept of group sound and groove, with the personal creative voice of individual players taking a back seat to the greater good of the collective ensemble. In keeping with the community-oriented spirit that permeates American culture uh, through the country's war efforts in World War II, the collaborative spirit of big band swing music aligns perfectly with the overarching spirit of the country that asks for all to, quote unquote, do their part in contributing to the common good. Rightfully so, Pollock's interview statement indicates that times were indeed changing, both culturally and socially, in post in, in post-war America, and that contemporary aims began to shift from the collective good of the needs of the individual. This shift, uh, this shift is intensified among African Americans who, after a long and involved connection with the war effort, feel particularly disenfranchised uh, by the continuing lack of basic and fundamental civil rights extended to them by mainstream America. Uh, this, at a very, uh, this is at the very heart of bebop's uh, starkly defiant nature and why this type of jazz is the perfect philosophical counterpart to Pollock's mural. Despite the connection that Bebop shares with Pollock's work in spirit, evidence suggests that he was not at all a fan of, of this particular style of jazz. Pollock's uh, jazz record collection consists entirely of music and or artists from Dixieland, swing, and stride style, and stride piano style. Uh, with a surprising lack of representation of the work of artists such as Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, and others who were literally redefining the meaning of jazz music in the 1940s. Pollock's apparent dislike of bebop is, uh, is not surprising, as bebop was not very, uh, very much an insider's as bebop was very much an insider's music. Those accustomed to listening to the danceable groove of swing bands in the 1930s found the prospect of wrapping their minds around the angularity and harmonic density of bebop to be a demanding task, and many turned their backs on this new uh, direction in jazz. This less than warm reception from the public mimics the public's initial reception to Pollock's work exactly, with both being slightly ahead of their time and both needing a period of time for the public to get properly acquainted before developing the ability to appreciate such unorthodoxy. But Pollock's work in such paintings as Miro and Bebop Jazz sought to redefine our concept of what makes art art and to invite us to reimagine the possible and to demand that we accept these new and innovative forms of expression not in comparison to what had come before it, but in the moment and on its own terms. At their core, both creative mediums advocate for the bending of convention in a way that is both logical and thought-provoking. 
the expression of the art's rea uh, reactions to the world around it for the benefit and nurturing of the aesthetic spirit that is within all of us. Of the innovators of bebop, no single artist is more iconic than alto saxophonist Charlie Parker. Uh, just as was the case with Pollock's work, Parker's imagination of the possible within his artistic medium was radically ahead of his time. Uh, though from drastically different cultures, these two men had a handful of things in common. Both men have a, document, a documented love for the work of Russian composer Igor Stravinsky. Pollock's wife named Stravinsky by name in her accounting of the music that he loved. And of course, there is always the famous story of Charlie Parker knocking on the door of Stravinsky's home, only to have the door slammed in his face. Uh, additionally, both Pollock and Parker shared the common uh, affliction of substance abuse, which, uh, in one way or the other, brought their lives to a premature end. Parker's music challenges a listener to reevaluate uh, their innate sense of melody, listen to the music with a quick and refined wit, and, like Pollock's work in Mirror, accept the music on its own terms and for its own sake. I have chosen to perform one of Parker's most famous compositions, Donna Lee, uh, today. Its long melodic phrases and angular melodic construction makes it difficult to know when the melody ends and the improvisation begins. Asking the listener to move past prior conceptions and approach the music with a different kind of ear. In comparison to more contemporary concepts of, melodic, of melody and improvisation, bebop melodies and improvisation border on sounding chaotic and random on the surface. But if you listen closely, you'll find that there is nothing at all neither random nor chaotic about it. Uh, while the order of things may be unfamiliar to me, it does indeed exist in a way that is deliberate, logical, and even relatable. It is easy to imagine art, observings, art observers having conversations of a similar ilk while viewing Pollock's mural for the first time. Please enjoy our rendition of Charlie Parker's
Please join us in the <laughs> 